I'm going to go ahead and start introducing people that are going to maybe be chiming in tonight. Uh, Debbie Curdy there, um, she works with developinginnovators.com. She and Steve have their business and they, um, I had her come on because she does all things technology and she and her husband actually hold classes for, so this is just shameless plug, but they have <laughs> classes for homeschoolers and usually they're, uh, they do camps in person and things like that. But over this last few months, they've had to switch everything over to the internet. So that's Debbie. And then Emily M is my first daughter. And then Taylor down there um, with the picture there is my second daughter. And I'll be talking about them in a minute, but they, they may be chiming in because I may be um, asking them to verify <laughs> what I'm saying. So anyway. Okay. So do you want me to kind of give the ground rules and then we'll jump yeah. in? And then we'll jump in because we're not going to have enough time if we don't. Yeah. So let me give you guys a couple of technical tips. Um, you should be able to see a chat button down at the bottom. If you click on that, the chat window will open up. And so as Cassie's talking, the format's going to be, she's going to kind of hit a topic and then um, have a Q&A piece and then kind of go back and forth like that. But if you have a question that comes to you, throw it in chat. And then Emily and I, when it's Q&A time, we'll just say, hey, you know, Taryn's got a question and then you can unmute yourself and ask the question and, um, and that will keep it going pretty well. But that allows us to see who has a question. And then every once in a while, she might, Cassie might ask, ask you guys a question, you know, like, what do you think about this? Just throw it in chat. Um, that's a good way to archive. I can show you guys at the end how to save chat. If you're in the window, I'll just tell you now. There's three little dots. Um, down where you type and if you click that it gives you a save chat option because there might be some good links and things that get put in there or some good comments so if you want to save a text copy of that it'll download it to your computer um, if you're on a tablet I'm not exactly sure where to find that but it should be there somewhere or we could send it to you um, mostly if you can try to keep your video on although we have lots of kids here um, frequently and I know kids do like to do zoom bombing and all sorts of fun things like that and so <laughs> Jamie's got like somebody walking around behind her. So if you want to turn your video off, go ahead. But what we found is it's more engaging for you and for Cassie to actually be able to see people's faces. That's always nice. Um, so try to keep that on. And then I think the other, only other thing is speaker view versus gallery view. Um, up in the upper right hand corner that you should see a button that lets you toggle. And so if you want to focus on Cassie, Click on speaker view and then she'll be big and maybe we'll just spotlight her when she's talking and that'll make that easy but um, if you want to see everybody then you go to gallery view and you can see all the people that are there and that's always kind of nice I like that also so it's just kind of up to you um, and if you can stay muted until it's your turn to talk because if your house is like my house there's all sorts of interesting noises happening all over the place and there's a reason there's a virtual background and <laughs> it keeps things um, kind of quiet. Anyhow, do, do you guys have any questions from us before we get started? Like just technical questions or is it all good? Give me a thumbs up if it's all good. Good, thumbs up is a good way. Um, that's it, Cassie, the floor is yours. I'm gonna, I'm gonna spotlight you so you're big. Oh yeah, make this, that shiny forehead bigger. <laughs> All right, you guys, um, welcome to Homeschooling Basics, and um, I'm Cassie Beardsley, and I'm going to try to stick, I'm going to try to stick to my notes so I can get through all the information I want to tell you, so um, if I'm not looking straight at you, just understand I'm trying to get through my material so we have time for questions, because I think that's going to be the most, um, some of the most important uh, time for us tonight is for me to help answer questions. So um, this is the first lesson um, that I have prepared and taught out of, um, gosh, I, my girlfriend and I started doing a homeschool seminar a number of years ago, and this would, is partially the part of the first lesson that I usually teach. Um, we've been teaching this to parents for a number of years and um, taught it to parents who are checking out homeschooling and who are already homeschooling. Um, we've also taught it to parents who are evaluating what they want to do in homeschooling 
and maybe for parents who want to take it up a notch. So I had one friend come three times because she was transitioning students or she was wanting to make some changes in her homeschool. So every time she would come, she would be rethinking what she was doing. So I think this information will be helpful to, to most of you, um, hopefully all of you, and I hope you find it uh, helpful and encouraging. So we have four goals for the workshop, and the first is to give a brief introduction to the world of homeschooling. And some of you guys, I know you all have homeschoolers because some of you have heard from Jennifer and Kelly and um, her daughter and me about, um, you know, this. So I know you're all interested in it, at least. Um, to help introduce, we're going to also um, introduce you to the basic legal covering options for your homeschool. And we're going to help you set a vision for your family. And we're going to discuss reasons to homeschool. Now, usually I would discuss purpose and reason and responsibility first, but I want to get the nitty gritty legal stuff out of the way so that you aren't thinking about that anymore. Why? Because I want to get to the heart of homeschooling. Because for me, that's the most important thing. So um, topics such as homeschool philosophies or choosing curriculum, uh, which legal covering is best for your particular family, how to do a co-op, learning styles, the how and why of good literature, how to set up your home for a lifestyle of learning, dads and homeschooling, all of those detail kind of oriented things I cover in my, um, you know, my, my full workshop. I'm not offering that tonight because it's 12 hours worth of stuff and um, we have two hours. So we're going to keep going. So let's get started. My husband, George, and I have been married for 32 years. We've lived in the high desert the whole time. And um, well, he grew up here in the desert. I moved into the desert. We met at High Desert Church in the singles ministry. My husband was not a pastor yet, but after we got married, um, he decided, well, before we got married, he decided to go to seminary and he became a pastor. And we have been at High Desert Church in Victorville for and um, we have three daughters our oldest is Emily and she's with us tonight and then um, our she is married with two wonderful grandchildren and I just love them to bits and she is um, homeschooling gonna be homeschooling her kids and then my second daughter Taylor um, she lives in the high desert. Emily lives in Torrance. Taylor lives in the high desert. She's also married and has one son who I love dearly. And she's also, she's already kind of, they're both doing schooling stuff with their children. And then our youngest is Madison and she's married and she doesn't have any kids quite yet. So, um, I really want to take the time to brag on my kids and how awesome they are. But, um, I really don't have a lot of time, so I'm just gonna let you guess about all that stuff. Some of you guys know them, so you'll know. Um, the privilege of getting to homeschool my kids is like no other that I've ever had, and I'm so thankful for it. And um, I'm so thankful for all that they have become that I attribute to their homeschooling, I really do. And so hopefully you'll catch some of what I mean as I go on. So our homeschool journey began the year that Emily was four, and we began discussing home, uh, schooling options for her. My husband's family had started a Christian school in the high desert, and we thought, of course, we'll just put him in the Christian school. Well, as we started considering school and looking at the price of the Christian school and everything, we just, there was no way we could afford that. And then, and public school was out of the question because we just didn't have the quality that we wanted. And we knew that the Christian school wasn't going to give the Christian foundation that we wanted for their education. So at that point, we were just stuck. We didn't know what to do. And then God started bringing homeschool parents into our lives. Now, back then, um, I want to be talking about that. <laughs> I want to be kind. But back then, the homeschool people that we knew, everybody said were weird. Okay? Now, I know we're going to, we hear that word, oh, homeschoolers are weird, they're this or that. But um, I, I'm going to read this to you because I don't want to miss say what I want you to know. So 
Um, 30 years ago, it was not an easy idea to consider homeschooling. People were still being put in jail for homeschooling their children and defying the school authorities. So back then, you had to be um, an off the grid kind of person to consider homeschooling to begin with. And you had to be bold and daring because it was a different road and it was so out of the ordinary. And the pioneers of homeschooling were really, a lot of them were really godly men and women seeking something better for their children. And many of them found it at great risk to them and their families. But this paved the way for me, who I would consider to be a settler. And um, so I'm hoping that I can pave the way, like they paved the way for me. I hope that I can pave the way for you guys. Some of who are, you guys are gonna be settlers and some of you are really refugees because you're running from something. And tonight I hope you to I hope to turn you into heading for something instead of uh, running from something, if you understand what I mean by that. So um, Emily was four and at that time, at four or five, she was still taking two hour naps in the afternoon. Some of you guys would just pay your children to take a two hour, hour nap every afternoon. But Emily was, she got the Beardsley gene of sleeping. So she was still taking a nap, you know, Taylor, they all still took a nap for two hours in the afternoon. And the preschool, uh, the kindergarten was an all day kindergarten. And they had the kids take a nap, but I'm thinking Emily's gonna be laying there on the floor on her little mat, sleeping away, and they're gonna have to come and wake her up. And, you know, I just, you know, it's your first child and you just, you know, you feel for him. And so I just couldn't imagine that. And then also too, I had taught her everything that she knew. George and I had taught her everything that she knew up to that point. And I didn't, I loved watching her learn. I loved watching all of them learn every step of the way. And I did not want to miss any more of that. And I, really, you guys, I could sit for hours just watching my kids do things because I just find great pleasure and joy in it, you know. And I do have girls, so they're not terribly destructive or they weren't terribly destructive. So that being said, you know, anyway, the homeschool world has really changed a lot, you guys. When we started homeschooling, there were two textbook companies and they were very ultra conservative, um, super right wing companies that were just textbook companies and they mainly sold to Christian schools. And I didn't want that. I didn't want to use textbooks for my homeschooling and there was just a smattering of independent mom and pop kind of startups for curriculum. And there was no internet back then. So now you guys, you have the world at your fingertips. And there's good things about that and there's bad things about that. So hopefully um, I can help you start a little bit on the good part of that. But anyway, um, when we told people we were thinking about homeschooling, a lot of eyebrows were raised and um, including my husband's. He didn't really want to homeschool, but he knew we couldn't afford school to, you know, to pay for private school. So um, God brought some good people into our lives and the really good homeschoolers, the really normal homeschoolers, you never really noticed because their kids fit in, they fit in, the parents weren't weird, you know. Um, and so God just started bringing some really normal, admirable homeschoolers into our lives. And um, he had a lot of concerns and fears about homeschooling, and I know you guys do too, and we're going to address a few of those in just a few minutes. But um, he pretty much just said, okay, we're going to try this. And at the beginning, it was just like, we're going to see how this goes. And he basically delegated the kids' education to me. I have a teaching credential. And uh, people go, oh, Cassie, you can homeschool because you have a teaching credential. Well, actually, sometimes my teaching credential got in the way because I had preconceived notions of what education should be like. And I tell people that um, it doesn't matter if you have an, uh, degree, a degree or not in education or whether you have a credential or not. If you are, if you are called to homeschool your kids, then God's going to give you everything that you need to do that. So, so before we go on. Um, I want to remind you that God, whatever you choose to decide, God is going to help you every step of the way. He helps you with your parenting. He's going to help you with the additional 
added responsibility of uh, schooling your kids in your home as well, if that's what you choose to do. And it's a super big privilege to school your children at home. And I really want to give you guys a vision for that um, tonight. So what I want you to do is I want you to think of three, two or three fears that you might have um, about homeschooling or about your ability in homeschool. And you can just pop them into the chat for us real quick. And um, just two or three fears that you have about your ability to homeschool. It can be anything. It's hard to narrow it down to just two or three, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right, should I be seeing answers in the chat? Um, they're, they're starting to come in. Okay. I'm trying to think back to what my fears were. So we have eight kids and we're down to the last one who's now a freshman in high school. Okay. Yeah, you guys are coming up with, um, this is exactly my list. Um, these are all the concerns that we hear all the time. Debbie and I hear these concerns all the time. And, you know, um, what if I'm not good at it? Social exposure, socialization, uh, that you're going to have to, the consistency to do the daily work. Um, you're already doing that, Taylor. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I think that all of our fears are the fears of a mom's heart because we have been given the responsibility to nurture and love our kids and our fears are going to come out of that desire and that role that God has given us. And so um, I want to, we're going to address some of these fears tonight. Um, but the, the first thing, the first one we're going to address is the legal stuff. Now I have given you guys notes. I don't know if you have your notes. I don't know if you printed them off. I didn't realize it was going to be this many pages, but uh, if you guys have your notes there, um, we're going to start going through that legal part, um, for you right now. Okay. Um, so, and then as we go on, we'll address some more of these fears about socialization and things like that. So. We're going to get one of the big fears out right now, and that's getting legalities out of the way. When most moms ask me about homeschooling, they really want to know about curriculum, and they want to know how they can re reproduce school at home. The other thing they want to know is how do I do this legally so that nobody comes knocking on my door? Now, when we started homeschooling, that was like a real true fear that somebody was going to come knock on our door and drag us off to jail for homeschooling our kids. Thankfully, we're in a, in a culture and society now where they're telling you to homeschool your kids because the school's closed. So it's a different world that we live in, thankfully. And um, some want the rules, some want to be convinced that you can do it and that your kids aren't gonna turn out weird, but we're gonna talk about the rules first. So, um, legalities of homeschooling in California. First of all, the compulsory school age for children in California is between the ages of six by December 2nd and under 18 years of age. All right, so if your children turn six in September, you don't have to put them in school that year. Um, they just have to be, um, excuse me, by December 2nd. So yeah, they have to be um, in school if they turn six by December 2nd. And then they're gonna um, have to be in school until they're under 18, until they're 18. Uh, those, I could go into the philosophy of all ages and all that kind of stuff and everything going with that, but just understand that the state can change this and they have tried to make man, uh, kindergarten mandatory. But right now, kindergarten is not required. 
Most people think that it is, it's not required. And if you do homeschool your kids with kindergarten, you don't have to file any paperwork or be legal in any sense of the word, all right? Um, so, you know, don't worry about kindergarten even. There's four legal coverings for homeschooling in California. There's three non-public options. We're gonna go over those first. And then there are, uh, then the rest are all charter options, which I kind of lump into one category. So you can choose any of these four options and still be within the law in California. Thankfully, California is homeschool friendly. Um, when I first started considering homeschooling, I was talking, well, actually I was, I was probably already homeschooling and I was sitting next to my, I taught school and I was sitting next at a fundraiser of some sort, the principal, who was the principal when I started teaching. And I said, oh yeah, we're homeschooling. He goes, homeschooling's not legal in California. I'm thinking, I just got scared to my soul. And then I realized that after researching and being taught and everything, realized that um, homeschooling is legal in California under a private school option. So the first thing we're going to talk about is um, filing your own affidavit as a private school. All right. So you know how like there's, we have a school in our desert called Hesperia Christian School, and it's a Christian school. And they graduate, whoops, sorry, they graduate people, they, you know, full curriculum sports and everything. If I file my own affidavit, the paperwork, to be my own private school, I am just like that private school. Now, obviously, the state's going to know that I'm a homeschool because I'll list my number of students as three or two, um, but I would be just like them and be under the same rules as them, except for some of the security and privacy rules and things like that, because I won't have any teachers I have to fingerprint, I won't have to be fingerprinted. So many of the rules they have for them are all um, the small private schools. If you're schooling your own children, you're exempt from. So don't worry about any of that. So the requirements for, the, um, for homeschooling, as a private school, you have a list there. We're just going to kind of go through those. So it's file your own affidavit as a private school. Number one, you must be capable of teaching. And I was talking to my daughter, daughter, Emily, and she goes, Mom, what do they mean by that? What does it mean capable of teaching? There is no written definition. Okay, there's no written definition. So it's pretty broad. Um, I think that if you were taken to court or, you know, maybe you're in a cu child custody battle or something like that, um, you know, one of the parents may say, well, they're not capable of teaching, you know, they're addicted to drugs and drinking and this and that, and they'd have to prove that you weren't capable of teaching. I don't know of anybody that that's, a, you know, they've ever said that up. So at least not in my world. So you have to be capable of teaching. Um, some people think that you should at least have a high school education. Um, I I don't know because I, I know some people who never graduated from high school are pretty darn bright. And um, it may just have been that you know, that wasn't their thing, but you must be capable of teaching. Second, subjects offered must be the same as the public schools and instruction must be in the English language. That's all it says. Now, there are, there are for the elementary school subjects, and I'll give you a, a link for that in just a minute. Uh, well, actually, I think it's in your notes, the hslda.org link. And you can see exactly, you can also go, I put a link in there in your paperwork for the California Department of Ed, and it gives you the exact code. And it gives you a list of the subjects that you have to teach, math, English, science, uh, social studies, and things like that. So it just gives you the, the subjects. It does not tell you how to teach and when to teach it. Okay? So that's really important for you to know, if you're your own private school, you get to determine those things, all right? Um, you have to keep attendance records. Um, you know, you can have a form online. There's plenty of programs, you know, for you just to check a box with the date and keep your attendance. Uh, you're also supposed to keep your shot records and immunizations. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, they have to all be kept in the file at home, which you should do anyway as a mom. And um, your annual affidavit must be filed every year in October with the state of California. Now you just do that online. You do a, um, a virtual signature on there and or a digital signature, whatever. And um, you have to maintain a list of courses of study 
and you have to maintain a list of instructors and their addresses and qualifications. Well, because you're a homeschool, I mean, because you're your own private school and your family, it might be your husband and really he's the principal and you're gonna be the teacher or the vice principal or whatever it asks for administrators. Now on the Homeschool Legal Defense site, um, it will tell you exactly how to fill that form out. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about Homeschool Legal Defense. I highly recommend that if you are filing your own affidavit as a private school or you go to the PSP, which we're gonna talk about next, um, some of them, the PSPs will require you to have a membership with Homeschool Legal Defense Association. If you file your own private school affidavit like we did, I highly recommend that you belong to Homeschool Legal Defense so that you have an attorney, okay, at your beck and call, so to speak. And they have homeschool attorneys and then they have other attorneys in your state that specialize in handling homeschool cases should there ever be a problem. They don't do custody court, they don't do any of the family dispute issues, but when it's a homeschooling issue, they will um, protect you. Uh, membership is uh, just over $100 a year. It's well worth your money. It's well worth the peace of mind that you have. There are great resources as well. If you go online, they have how to homeschool. They have all kinds of stuff. So I highly recommend them. And it's um, hslda.org. It's on your paperwork. Um, so filing your own affidavit as a private school, it requires no outside involvement or supervision apart from what the state requires of all programs and what I listed above. There's no testing required. This is one thing I really appreciated because I did not follow the same scope and sequence that a public school would follow. And so to be tested, um, it wasn't really gonna be fruitful for my family. It wasn't gonna tell me anything. Um, this is a popular option for those who don't want the oversight and requirements that other options will require, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, there's no one to report to regarding schedules or scope and sequence, is what I just said. So if you're like a, you know, if you wanna do your own thing, you don't wanna have to answer and turn in paperwork and do all that, then I, the affidavit's a great way to go. It's got um, great benefits as far as autonomy and freedom. Um, one thing I do recommend is if you Go do file an affidavit that you choose a school name because you get to name your school. You choose a school name that doesn't have your family name. Don't do like we did. And back then I said, oh, Beersley Academy. You know, um, they recommend that you don't do that anymore. So um, any questions? Do you guys have any questions on any of that? Okay, I know I'm throwing a lot of information at you and it's just going to get faster here. So the next option is filing under a private school program or a PSP. It's also called an umbrella school. When I was uh, first starting out, they called them an umbrella school. And with this option, you're a private, a private individual or a group of individuals or an organization can create a private school. They'll file the paperwork and you just fall under their legal covering and you're just a number on a page. One of the benefits about this way of doing it is that you are just a number. Your children are just a number on a page. There's no name. Um, when you file your own affidavit, they do have, you know, they would have the principal's name and the administrator's name or whatever, but they don't have my children's names, but they do have our names. Um, on the PSP, they do not. So you're simply just a teacher for the school, I guess. So an example of this would be Hesperia Christian Academy in our area. We have the Christian school I was telling you about, and they have an academy, and they have their homeschoolers are all under that. And so the homeschoolers can take classes at the, at the high school or at the elementary school. They have programs for them. You can participate in sports, and we'll talk more about what all that includes. And then some umbrellas are just a mom and a dad, and they say, oh, you know, let's do this for other homeschool families. We'll file the paperwork, and then we'll keep everybody accountable, and then, um, then they can re remain anonymous and then feel like they have some sort of accountability. Because some of you will want accountability. Um, you know, maybe like you were saying, you know, you don't feel like you have the discipline to keep up with everything, then you may want that kind of accountability. You may want somebody checking in with you quarterly or monthly going, okay, show me the paperwork. What have you been doing? How are the kids doing? And things like that. Um, this option, 
Um, the PSP can set their own requirements for record keeping and they should be requiring you to keep some pretty clear records. Um, graduation requirements. So at the end of the year, they may offer like a little graduation ceremony. You know, maybe there's, you know, three graduating seniors and they might offer a little ceremony, but they should have their own graduation requirements. Um, they'll have requirements for meetings and things like that. They vary in price because if somebody's providing you a service, they're going to want to be paid for that. And they vary in the activities that are offered. So some, um, some schools do provide sports and things like that. Some schools don't. Um, it's, you just have to ask the questions. And I think I gave you guys, did I provide the list of questions for you guys? I should have, I think that was one of the, um, one of the handouts should be the list of questions and things to ask the, um, to ask the different schools. So if not, I'll send that out um, later. So this option has a low to medium amount of school involvement and influence in your life as a homeschooler, depending on the program. Some programs require testing in some or all grades. So if you're part of a Christian school, they may um, require testing. If you're just part of a family program, they may not require testing at all. Okay, so you just have to learn to ask the right questions. And I think I did provide you guys with a list of those to ask. All right, any questions on the PSP? I think um, someone had one. Do they fill in teacher as their, um, as their what was it, occupation when they fill that out? Do you write that you're a teacher? No, no, I don't think so. I, I was reading on the legalities of this and they said that under the state, you're kind of considered a teacher. But they won't, because you're teaching your own children, they understand that you're exempt from the, from the uh, fingerprinting laws and all those kinds of things because you're not teaching on site at a location. Okay. So being, a, being in a PSP is really super simple. You call the person, you say, Hey, I want to be in your PSP. You know, what are your, what are your requirements and things like that? They may say it's $30 a month. I'm going to file your paperwork. You have to join homeschool legal defense. Um, these are the graduation requirements and so on. So it's really quite simple to be part of a PSP. Um, for some people, to be part of a PSP, uh, for example, with a Christian school, might be really beneficial. It will be more expensive because they're offering more, but you may be able to um, participate in their sports program. And for some of you, I know that's one reason why you want to keep your kids in public school. And I'm not saying that's not a good reason, but it shouldn't be the reason that you have your kids in public school if that, you know, if you're considering homeschooling, I would look at that option for sports and things like that. And I know for dads, sports are super, super important. Um, and some of the Christian schools have some really good homeschool support and things like that for their homeschoolers. And a lot of homes, a lot of uh, cr private Christian schools are wanting the homeschoolers because it helps um, pad their budget and their, and their income. So you might look at some of the Christian schools in your area and ask them, call them and ask them if they have a homeschool program. Okay. And Cassie, I put in a direct link to HSLDAs because they literally have like a step-by-step field-by-field guide for how to fill out the PSA. If people yeah. do that. That makes it really easy. You just kind of like have that up, have the form up. It takes like three minutes to fill out if that much. It's pretty easy. Yeah. Um, you know, somebody was asking me back on the can kids start um, schooling earlier. You can start homeschooling on day. You are homeschooling on day one. Okay. You don't have to start homeschooling on day one. You're teaching your ch children on day one. God made you to teach your children. Okay. You're teaching them how to eat. You're teaching them manners. You're teaching them how to get up in the morning. You're teaching them how to eat three meals a day and, and to do all those kinds of things. So you can do school any, to start any time you want. You have to officially, legally be schooling, okay, if they're six by December 2nd. Okay, is that what we said? December 2nd. So um, uh, our daughter, Emily, when we started homeschooling, it was uh, six by September something. And um, she wasn't old enough and she, her birthday's in November. So we didn't have to worry about it. So I started her later. Um, to be honest with you, 
official schooling, the later the better, okay? Especially with boys. You're gonna think, oh, they're so ready to go to school because they like the friends and all that, but oftentimes boys are not even ready to start school and that's one of the reasons why I think homeschooling is so great, especially in the early years, is because some kids just need that extra time, you know, till they're nine or 10. So, um, you know, if he's already ready for preschool, then go ahead and start teaching him. You don't have to do even an official curriculum. Um, so, okay, let's go back to the third option. And this is the option, uh, number three, credentialed tutor, a credentialed tutor. I thought, oh, I can tutor my own kids. I've got a teaching credential. Well, come to find out, I would have needed a teaching credential in elementary ed, which would have been fine for elementary, but then when they get into high school, I would have needed a credential in every single subject. I know, really. So um, this option might be good for somebody who has the resources to pay for a private tutor. And um, the rules are you have to school for 175 days out of the year for three hours per day. Okay, so that's not even very, that's not even a very hard um, uh, requirement. Okay, 175 days for three hours a day. Okay, so you guys are all going, I could do that. So that's all they're expecting for a tutor. So, you know, think about what their ideas are and what you could be doing um, for seven, you know, 175 days for three hours per day. Anyway, this option isn't usually practical for most uh, families due to the cost and credentialing requirements. There's no testing requirements with this option. The Homeschool Legal Defense website um, has a page outlining all of the requirements and options for these three private homeschooling options. Homeschool legal defense will not defend you legally if you are schooling with a public charter school, okay? They are only for private homeschoolers, either with a PSP or with filing your own affidavit. Those are the only people they'll cover, okay? So now we're gonna, and then I left, I gave you uh, four links, California Homeschool Network, they're really good. They've got a really great how to homeschool. I highly recommend you guys go to some of these resources. You're going to read the same stuff I'm giving you. You're going to read it all again. It's going to get into your head and it will alleviate a lot of your concerns the more you know, because you're going to go, I think I can do this. Okay. And I know you can. I know you can. Um, Chia of California, it's a Christian homeschool educators of. Um, in Cal Association in California. They're a conservative homeschool group. They have um, great resources on their side as well. Um, they don't really, um, they're not really uh, keen on charter public charter schools. They're really conservative when it comes to their views on homeschooling and think that Christian parents should just be homeschooling without the state involved. Um, homeschool Legal Defense. And then the state of California, I gave you their site that has the requirements. You guys can look at that and you're going to go, that's it. That's all they require. And I'm going to say, yes, that's all they require. Take it and run with it. Okay. Take it and just be creative and run with it. So the fourth option, and this is the option most of you are probably already familiar with because you have a friend or a relative or somebody that you know that's uh, in a public charter school. There are varying types of charter schools. These people want to get together. They say, this is what we want our school to look like. They lay it all out. They write up a charter, and then they are chartered in the school in a particular school district, and then the state recognizes that charter. Um, this is a popular choice for many parents who are no, new to homeschooling. And for those who want the money, I always call it a carrot, but it's not that it means it's bad. It's just, you know, it's to get you to enroll in their school. Because if you enroll in their school, they get the state money, okay, that the public school would get in, they're getting it instead, and then they're passing some of that on to you. Um, charters are public schools. They provide legal covering, teacher assistance. They uh, have certain required curriculum, and they'll oftentimes provide you that curriculum. Um, they offer some supplies. They offer, uh, you'll have a schedule because you're on a school's calendar, 
and they'll offer you accountability. They'll also offer you teacher help and things like that um, if they're able to. So not all the supervising teachers are as helpful as other ones. Some of them are fantastic Christian, godly people uh, supervising, and some of them just don't know really much about how to think outside of the public school box because most, if not all, have come out of the public school setting where they were schooling 30 kids in a classroom and not homeschooling children at a kitchen table. Okay, and it, there's a big difference there. So um, they used to be able to offer on-site classes and they cannot do that anymore. The, for various reasons, the teacher union and things like that, they're starting to squeeze on the, the public charter schools and um, starting to the state's starting to restrict what they offer. This happens every time there's public money involved. You know, people take advantage of the public money and then they have to start instituting uh, requirements and restrictions to control um, fraud and how that money is being spent. Plus, the teachers unions do not like the charter schools, you know. Some parent, uh, some teachers don't mind, but the union is not in support of the charter schools. So, um, if you're a part of a public charter, don't be surprised if they start narrowing their benefits and what they can offer you. But I think it's a great option for people who are just starting to homeschool and you want some hand holding. Um, and you know that that extra money is not you know doesn't hurt either. So. Um, this resource, when Debbie and I probably, uh, Debbie, how long have you been homeschooling, Debbie? My oldest child is 32, I think. <laughs> when you have eight kids, you kind of lose track. Um, so he's 32, and I didn't homeschool all of them the whole time, but they've all been homeschooled at least part of the time. And Adam, who's 14 and a half, has never been to public school. And so we always filed a PSA. In the last two years, we did a homeschool charter but when he goes into high school, we're gonna go rogue again and file a PSA. Okay, yeah, so when Debbie and I first started homeschooling, there were no such thing as charter schools. Right. Okay, you either, you either were with a PSP or on your own, or you maybe could, maybe could do an independent study program with a, with a school, but really there were no homeschooling options other than those. So you guys have this whole world, this whole banquet set before you, and hopefully some of what we're talking about is going to help you decide what you want to do. You can choose different options as you go along too. If you need a, want, you know, if you need to spend more money and you don't have it in your budget, you could do a charter school for a year or two. And then, you know, I have a friend and she, I think she did five or six different schooling options in the whole time she homeschooled her kids. Well, and, we, and we have some families that have one kid in one charter, one kid in another charter, just because of the benefits. Or some families that have one kid in a charter, but a couple of kids, they're just the homeschooling independently. Like there's a whole mix of things that you can do. Right. And some of it is just what's best for you at the time and what's best for your children at the time. Okay. Um, so they're not offering, the, the full homeschool charters are not offering uh, on-site classes anymore. Some of them were saying, oh, let's meet at the church, you know, at this church, and we'll take a, we'll just offer a class there. They're not allowed to do that anymore. Um, I was talking to a charter teacher late, uh, just recently, and she said that the state is gonna start cracking down on how they hand out their money and how much control they have over the money and what you can spend it on. Because of course, you know, whenever you hand somebody free money, well, I guess if somebody hands you money, it's free, but they're gonna control more about how it can be spent. And some people are taking advantage of that. Um, so many will choose this option for the free curriculum, the resources, and for the help given by a credentialed teacher. Just so you know, your credentialed teacher that is supervising you they, some schools supervised by grade, some schools hand families to credential teachers. So your credential teacher may, you know, they may have been like a, an early uh, elementary teacher, but here they are helping you trying to decide on how to do high school curriculum with your high school senior or junior. And I know the schools are trying to help, they're trying to train parents and things like that, but just be aware that those 
those poor teachers don't know any more about choosing curriculum than, um, you know, than what you do uh, sometimes, you know, they're being more, they're getting more and more trained, but their, their scope is very limited. So um, this option has a medium to high amount of influence in your homeschool program, depending on the program and your supervising teacher. Uh, testing is required the same as in public full day schools, although I do know some parents who have been able to avoid it. Um, Debbie, did you guys do testing? You know, we're a little rogue on that. So I always opt out and I quote California Ed Code. And I'm the, I was the parent because we did public school and I've been on school boards and site councils. Like I've done education all the way around. So I was always a parent that wrote the big long letter opting out of testing because it's stupid and costs too much money and doesn't tell teachers anything. And I would quote California Ed Code. And then they'd be like, I don't know what we're doing with that family, but <laughs> they always wanted us to test, but um, we pretty much always opted out. Yeah. Well, useful. Benchmark and, testing, benchmark testing is useful because then you get something back right away that says kind of here's the level, but the standardized state tests that they don't even get the results back to like next October, the kids already like that ship has sailed. So the, you know, it doesn't do the teacher any good with that data and it doesn't do you any good with that data. So we yeah. always opt out of that. Well, and the other thing is, too, if you're, you know, if, if they're testing for certain subjects in certain grades in high school, and I'm not even covering that subject that year, because maybe I've got two kids in high school, and I'm, I'm uh, schooling them on the same maybe subject matter, you know, to make it easier on myself, we're doing all the history together and everything, or maybe we're doing the same science, well, they may not even get tested on this, you know, they're not ready for those tests and exams and things, so um, you just get to make those decisions for your own family. Um, I mom, quick, I'm just gonna cut in for a second. Okay. I think Jamie's asking some good questions and Debbie's answering these, but I think this might be helpful for everyone just to say. Um, so say that you choose one of these options and you start into a school year and you don't like your option. What do you do then? Can you just disenroll from? you know, the charter and then, but then did you miss the a deadline to no. your own private school? So how does that work? You can, um, what you need to do, and I know that Homeschool Legal Defense, I think, or uh, California Homeschool Network has this letter on their website on how to disenroll your child from a school and how to, you know, exactly how to do that. Yeah. There, it, you know, you want to come up with a letterhead for your school and things like that. And you send a letter saying, I'm withdrawing such and such a child. I'm requesting their QM, QM folder. So the instructions to do that are on the California Homeschool Network site. And uh, HSLDA can help you with that as well. Um, because if you're going to be moving into a private program, HSLDA, and you, and you decide to join them, then they will help you do that. Um, yes, you can move your kids around mid-year, mid-stream. If something's not working for you, I highly recommend that you move your child, okay? Don't stay in a program that's not working for you, that's causing more frustration. One of the beauties of homeschooling is if something's not working, you get to change. Now, that doesn't mean you should change math curriculum every week. Just because Joey doesn't have the discipline to sit down, maybe Joey, maybe you need to work on Joey's discipline before you worry about the math okay so um homeschooling allows you to be able to do what is best for your child so let me just throw in only one caution there is that if you are with a charter and you have spent the funds by the way they don't put the funds in your bank account you just kind of have an account that you can charge from but if you've already spent the funds and it's on it just depends on the school. They might ask you like repay some stuff if it's consumable stuff and you've already used it and they might not, but they might. And if you try to jump into a different charter, they have wait lists, like they close enrollment at different times. So they all, the way schools work is they get funded for how many kids they had last year. And so if they go over cap, then they don't get paid for those extra kids. And so they might implement wait lists. That's usually in the spring is when the wait list hit. But just kind of be aware of that. And the only other thing to be aware of, um, if you're disenrolling from a public school, and I know this from experience talking to parents here locally, the regular public school may put an awful lot of pressure. Like I've had parents that have gotten phone calls from the school secretary saying, you're not allowed to do this. You have to come in. You need to do this. 
You don't need to do any of that stuff. You file the letter, your job is done. File the letter, file your PSA, you're done. The school will try to get you back in because it's, they get a lot of money for your kids. It's money. It all comes down to money. But it was, I, I had one parent here in Phelan that was getting literally strong armed, getting calls constantly for about two weeks. I told her, don't even answer the phone. Like you don't owe them anything. Just go do your thing. And you know, she did. So don't get bullied into choices. Right. And if you happen to be in the high desert, we do know people in every district. We so know people. we know people. <laughs> so if you live in the desert, talk to Debbie. She knows more people, but we do know people. Oh, I don't know. You know a lot of people too. Yeah, we do. Um, but if you're a troublemaker, I'm not going to, I'm not even going to vouch for you. Well, but there, there really is just a step-by-step -step thing to disenroll from a school, whether it's one of the, and the charters are public schools. Cassie's right about that. They're fully public schools. They can require testing. They're all the same um, outcome things that, you know, public school kids, benchmarks that they're supposed to hit all those. And all you have to do is write that letter and you just say, we're done. And then I, if you can't get into another charter right away, then file a PSA. Like that's super easy to do. And then you're covered. They can't come say you're a truant. When we first homeschooled here, we actually had somebody from Snowline show up at our gate wanting to know why our kids weren't in school like a truant officer from snow line i'm like oh here's our paper sorry oh wow that's weird i never had anybody well we were doing excelsior and we disenrolled from excelsior which is not really a homeschool charter right but so we disenrolled from excelsior and excelsior was mandated to report to snow line kids that disenrolled so they could track that they went to snow line but we didn't go to snow line so snow line came here to find out i'm like sorry yeah, yeah. One of the other things that I want to tell you is that you can file an affidavit any time during the year, but I highly suggest that you file your affidavit before you disenroll. Okay, so file that affidavit and then disenroll. You are obligated to file your affidavit as soon as you start homeschooling. Okay, and you the the thing is is they take in October they take all the enrollment for all the schools in the state. That's just the time period where they do that. They wait for people to come and go, to move, to get their populations and census all situated, and then they say, okay, who's at your school? All right, so that's why it's October. Otherwise, it's a mess and schools are never turning their stuff in, so they have to have a deadline, and so it's purely for their record keeping. And you know, in deference to the public school system, they are spending taxpayer money, and they are you know, fortunately trying to be accountable for that money that they're spending for public education. So yes, you know, we think it's all about control. Sometimes for some people it is, but a lot of times it's for financial accountability, okay? And you don't wanna be one of those people who take advantage of the system and, oh, I'm just gonna go to this charter, you know, like Debbie was saying, buy a bunch of curriculum and then I'm out of here. That's not right, okay? Well, and honestly, some of the scrutiny that's getting hit with charter schools, the homeschool charters, this in the last two years has been because of stuff like that. And there was yeah. one or two bad charters that did, like they enrolled kids for the summer and then the kids would go back to their regular charter, but then the one school didn't disenroll them. So they were like double dipping. On, you know, it was a big mess. Yeah. So There's a whole lot of scrutiny on it. It has been super interesting, given all the flack homeschoolers have gotten in California for the last couple of years, to then see our governor say, guess what, you're all homeschooling now. <laughs> Anyhow, that's a different question. Yeah. Right. Um, Lauren was saying, um, online-based homeschooling options. Okay, so let me keep going, and then I'll address some other options, okay? Um, so... Um, There are other types of public charter schools that are hybrids of independent study programs and online on-site classes. So for example, in the desert, we have a school called Excelsior that Debbie just mentioned. That yes, you can homeschool, they'll give you material and things like that. It's more of an independent study at home. And then they also offer classes at a campus and they offer some sports classes. Then they, uh, Excelsior just happens to be on purpose built right next to the junior college. So many of their students will do junior college classes their junior and senior year and come out with an AA 
um, at the end of high school. Now, Excelsior happens to be a junior high and high school program. They often don't have these kind of programs for elementary because they're not necessary. But um, so there are some hybrids like that. Now, um, Lauren is talking about Laurel Springs. It's an accredited homeschool. Yes, there are all kinds of online homeschool programs. I gave, uh, you have the list of things that you need to ask them. So the Laurel Springs would be just like um, a private school PSP, okay? So that would, it would fall under the private school um, uh, legal requirements. So the PSP requirements, all right? Any other questions on that? Nope, does that answer that? Okay, one last option for some of you, and we have um, some good friends that are doing this, and that's the independent study program through a high school. Uh, those programs are building, um, they're kind of like the, like the Christian schools provide, is that you do independent study work, you can do classes in a classroom, sometimes you can take classes at the school, and then you can participate in sports. They will have certain requirements, it is a public school, you'll have all the things that go along with public school, but they'll just send homework home with you to do at home, okay? Any, so they, they do have those programs. Many of the high schools do, if not all of them, will have some sort of independent study program. All right, so you see there's so many options, and the best thing to do is to figure out who you are as a family, what your needs are, and which of these many options is going to best meet the needs of your family. Debbie, I'm not sure. I don't believe there's any elementary schools that have independent study programs unless you're like on... Well, Snowline has... I can't remember what they call it. Snowline's got some independent study program that will go down lower. Uh -huh. um, and I think they come in and meet with a teacher and... Um, It'll be interesting because in the fall, nobody knows exactly what's going to happen. Like, there's going to be some mix of, for all grade levels, of independent study and distance ed and on campus, but it'll be interesting to see how that shakes out because nobody knows. Yeah. Um, so um, just be aware that, you know, especially with the whole COVID thing and all that, everything's in a flux. But yeah. what I'm giving you now is what's in, in practice and what's been going on for a number of years. So, so there's so many options and programs for students, especially the older they get. The best thing to do is to determine your philosophy of education, what your desires are for your family, your child's needs, and then consider the options. Now, like I said, I don't have time to walk through all of that with you today. I would love to be able to do that, and I will offer an opportunity um, in the next week or so for you to know more about um, a, an opportunity to do that. Okay, so let me address information about immunizations right now, because I know Kathy, some of you, oh yeah. So there's a question that probably falls into this previous category about enrolling students into a community college if you're on an affidavit. Can I take a second and respond to that? Yes. So I'm a community college professor um, out of BVC. I teach uh, the, like the Computer 101 class. And I always have homeschoolers almost every semester in my class. We kind of joke that it's the gateway drug to college because, because I, if I know they're homeschoolers and I kind of work with the parents in a back channel way a little bit. Um, we take anybody, pretty much, uh, if you're ninth grade and above. And if you're a, um, you have to get what's called concurrent enrollment. And so if you're with a charter school, then the charter has to fill out the concurrent enrollment form, like some counselor, I don't actually know how it works, uh, like who at the charter would do that, but there's usually a counselor that fills it out or the teacher or somebody, and then you, but if you are filing your own thing, then you fill it out. Like all my kids all went to BBC, and my husband was the principal and I was the teacher and we just filled it out. We just signed the right spots. I think he signed as the educational administrator and I signed as the parent, whatever. Yeah. And you just carry it over there and you fill it in. You have to be really specific about like what classes you want to take because they'll approve it based on certain classes. And there's certain classes you can't take, like um, English, you can't, most of the English classes you can't take if you're under 16, only because of some of the reading material. And they are adult classes. And we could do a whole other seminar on like how to help your kids, maybe we should, on how to help your kids prepare to show up in my class because some are really well prepared and some are not so well prepared. Um, but you can definitely do it. It's called concurrent enrollment. So that's what you're looking for. So yeah, then you get college credits and high school credits. And there's a lot of different uh, colleges and things that'll do that um, depending on where you live and uh, what colleges are nearby. 
some colleges yeah, are more community friends. colleges will do it um i don't know i don't cal states like the universities probably won't i don't know that for a fact yeah it's usually private colleges and things yeah. like that yeah yeah my niece and nephew did that in kentucky there was a, a christian a catholic school nearby that they were able to take quite a few courses so Gosh, you guys, for everything you want, it's out there. It really is out there. But most of you guys have little kids, um, so you have a little bit of time, I think, for some of you. Um, so let me ask you um, to, um, take a break. Let's take a five minute break. So if you need to get a snack or you need to stand up and move around or you need to use a restroom or whatever, let's take a five minute break. And if you want, um, Debbie and Emily will be sitting here. I know Taylor can answer questions too if she wants. So you can ask them any questions. So you can unmute and ask a question. And then I'm just gonna stand up for a minute. Yeah, me too. And then, so <laughs> so <laughs> we're gonna return in about, Five at eight oh five. We'll return now. You have the sound of four minutes. Yeah, you should definitely get up and stretch. Yeah, we did a whole fitness class in Zoom, and we did a dance class in Zoom with the little kids. It was great. Look at there. There goes Cassie. <laughs> I'm not the one to teach dancing. We had a girl in a wheelchair teaching dancing. It was fabulous. It was great. So does anybody have any questions or anything? So we have a Laura's iPhone and then Laura Bolton, and I don't know if that's the same person. It's two different people. Two different people. Yeah. So does Cal Baptist let homeschoolers in? Uh, Cal Baptist, um... Sorry. Um, are you asking me? Sorry. Yeah, I'm just curious because you said yeah. you're adjunct at Cal Baptist. Um, I'm actually not sure. I just started teaching this last spring, um, and I only teach one course through one of their master's programs. Okay. Um, so but I had to. You probably don't have homeschool students in that class, right? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Um, I had taken some classes at VBC um, through concurrent enrollment, but I was um, at a public charter. So I just wasn't sure how it worked if we were doing it just kind of on our own. So that's why I asked that. No, you just Thank fill out you. the form. Yeah, same, same way. And, you know, a couple things, and I know Debbie, Debbie and I could sit down and talk about, we actually, Debbie and I did a, a preparing your um, well, we were preparing the parents to have a junior high and high school student. So we are, um, you know, we could spend, uh, you know, three hours talking about high school, junior high and high school and preparing for college. But um, you, one of the things I want to encourage you is that if you're preparing your kids for college is that you do not be one of the helicopter parents who do all the interference running for your children. Right. So just be aware of that. Um, but I think most of you guys have young young children and just in junior high age or so. so. Mom, we had a couple people that got on a little bit late just due to some internet issues. Um, um, so without, you know, recapping everything you said, um, where should they, if they miss kind of those first kind of legality things, um, obviously I think we're going to do a recording that we could give people. Um, yeah. But is there anything briefly that you just want to catch them up on so they're not completely out of the loop? I know one person asked, um, about even just the the do we talk I don't know just anything basic um what you said about sports teams playing like where should they first look for things like if their kids want to play sports um, um, if like your that. kids want to if you are wanting your kids to be in sports through the elementary and junior high age usually you can do clubs you know just the normal little league and things like that and club sports um, and club teams, I know those are, are big, but then they're very time consuming. A lot of those parents actually homeschool their kids. Um, and then there are options, and I would highly recommend checking out a private, the PSP option. Um, and you can check with the Christian schools, um, because oftentimes the, the Christian schools that have a site will be able to provide sports for your kids. It'll cost more. You know, it's not free. You're going to have to pay for the, all the services they offer. And they will have certain requirements you want to look at. And um, that's a really good way to get into sports. The other thing is a public charter. Sometimes the public charters 
uh, if they're like an Excelsior type program, it's not really even a charter, it's more of a blended kind of program, uh, they can offer sports as well. But remember that whenever you're, whenever they're providing you a service, there's going to be requirements. So the more services they offer, the more requirements there are going to be. So sports through public schools is just not an option or does that vary county to county? It varies school to school, like district to district, I think. It's a district policy whether the kids can do sports or not. If right. They in the school. Yeah, I know that for in our snow line district, that if you're in their independent study program. Now remember that the public charters are not, they're not part of your school district unless the district is the one that um, extends the charter. And I know like Snowline doesn't have a charter that I don't think they have. Um, I think Heritage is a charter school, but it's not they're like, a magnet they're not homeschool charters. So yeah, they're not a charter anymore. Oh. I think they're a magnet now, something like that. But um, if you are part of their independent study program, then you'll have access to all the sports that they offer. So, but remember, it's an independent study program. It's not a homeschool program. You're not going to have as much freedom. So if you want to be, file your own affidavit and everything and just do it that way, sometimes you can find homeschool sports leagues in your area. And sometimes you just have to go through um, the, you know, the club teams and things like that. Okay. Anything else? You guys ready to go again? All right, let's keep going. It, Jamie, it depends, again, it depends on the school about that dual enrollment. It just depends. Because it really is like a school-wide or district-wide policy. It's not a statewide mandate. Yeah, and the thing is, if you're in like a, like, a, let me think of, Sky Mountain is one of the local charters in our area, and they don't have sports. They have no facility. They have no sports. They're purely just a homeschool charter. So it depends on the type of charter school that you have. Um, and it, it, like I said, it, the charter's what they come up with. And so you're going to have to just start asking questions in the district and things like that. Okay, make the phone calls if you need to. And the, and the charters handle the concurrent enrollment units differently too. Because we had a student, a high school student, um, that was in one homeschooled charter, but then wanted to start taking more classes at Antelope Valley Christian, or Antelope Valley College, he lived over in Lancaster, and the charter he was with would only allow like one class per year to count concurrently, but then the other charter allowed four classes per semester, I mean not per year, and so he jumped over to the other charter because he was ready to do most of his coursework through the college, and there's just a huge variety in how they handle things, so you got to yeah. ask the questions. Yeah. Now, Jamie, you're talking about Sky Mountain. Sky Mountain is Sky Mountain is a full day. I mean, they are a full homeschool charter. Yeah. They have no campus or anything like that. Excelsior has campuses and um, they have learning centers and things like that. They're a whole different animal than just a homeschool charter. Okay, like Sky Mountain is, and they don't have any campuses. They don't let you do that anymore. Um, yeah. so, so, so that's their policy. That's their policy. Yeah. And I don't know. I'm just going to use Snowline as an example. I don't actually know what their policy is. Snowline might be okay with a kid being registered in a different school but playing their sports. I don't know if they are or not, but it's up to the, it's yeah. up to the schools. Yeah, I don't think it's that way in Snowline. I would be very surprised. I think they would tell you to go through their independent study. Well, pro probably, but that's their choice as a school. Yeah. It's a so it's a district. It's a district choice as to what they allow. Yeah. So the good thing, the thing is to just be firm and ask good questions yeah. and educate yourself on, uh, you know, your area and things like that. And you guys, I, you know, you have friends who are homeschooling in charters. You have friends that are doing all different kinds of things. Oftentimes people go, I'm just going to do what my friend does because they're familiar and it's somebody who's taken the steps before me. And that's fine. But you're gonna, you might waste time doing that if you have other needs that are different than your friend's needs. Your kids may be different. So you need to look at your own family and what your own family's needs are. Do your own homework. Don't be scared about calling the school district and asking questions. And don't take no for an answer if they just brush you off or we don't do that. Just double check and make, and make sure of that. Talk to teachers that you know that are in the district or principal of a school. You know, they would know those things as well. 
Um, so now on to the fun stuff. Um, got all that legal stuff. Why homeschool and your responsibility as a parent? Um, you, there are so many good reasons and you guys already listed a lot of the reasons of why, um, or some of the reasons why you might not want to be in a public school and that you're checking out the homeschool. Um, I'm going to talk about three responsibilities that every Christian parent has, no matter where your kids are in school, there are three responsibilities. There's a few more, but I'm going to cover three about, um, being a Christian parent. And the first one is from a well-known parenting passage in Deuteronomy 6, and I'm going to read this for you. These are the commands, decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess, so that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you, and so that you may enjoy long life. Hear, O Israel, be careful to obey so that it may go well with you, and that you may increasely, increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your fathers, promised you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commands that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Now God here is admonishing the Israelites to remember and then to remind their children so that they do not think it was them who attained all that they have attained. Um, this was the driving force and the driving passage really for me and my homeschooling. And um, we desired for our children to know the Lord. We could only talk um, about all of these things um, day and night and all through their lives if they were at home. And we wanted, to, we wanted God and the knowledge of God and his word to permeate their lives and we could only do that if we had the time. And um, my husband always says, you're not going to get quality time without quantity time. There's a fallacy of quality time. You can't just say, okay, Jessica, I want you to uh, tell me everything about yourself. Um, we're going to develop this relationship. You got one minute. All right? That just doesn't happen. It comes out of quality time spent together. So... Um, you as a parent, you've been entrusted, your children have been entrusted to you by God, and he's made your job clear as a parent. You are to love and nurture your children into his kingdom, and you're to teach them to love him with their heart, soul, mind, and strength. And that's the whole person, okay? You're to teach the whole person to love God. Now, granted, you're going to do some of the outside work, but he's going to do the inside work. And you're going to prepare the soil, you're going to plant the seeds so that God can bear the fruit in the lives of your kids. This is your responsibility, and how it fleshes out in your family is up to you. It does not matter where you put your kids into school. This is your responsibility. Um, and you really, as a Christian parent, you have to take that seriously, which I think all of you are now because you're all sitting here listening to me go on. And um, one day you're going to stand before God and he's going to go, okay, tell me how you did with those kids I gave you. And you're going to give an accounting. And so no matter what you do, where they go, you um, need to be deliberate and intentional in raising your children and in building relationships with them and bridging the relationship between them and God. It's going to be God. It's going to be you guys. It's going to be your kids. One day you're going to be gone. And then it's going to be God and your kids. And how you did this job is going to set up for how this looks, okay? Um, they're going to see you as the first authority, and how you exert that authority, how you do the decision-making and things is really going to affect their view of God and their relationship with him. And that's why I do this, this workshop, you guys, because um, many years ago, my friend Stacy and I uh, saw a lack of deliberation and purpose in the homeschool parents that were running away from the from the public school. I said this earlier, you know, some of you are running away from the Christian school. I want you to be running to something, not away from something. And um, 
we saw a lot of parents missing the opportunity to uh, build deep and meaningful relationships with their kids and building that um, bridge between their kids and the Lord. And um, parents just wanted to hand that responsibility off. And I don't blame them. It's a big responsibility. I had a friend yesterday I was talking to, and she was working full time as a PA. And she has a really debilitating illness now, and she had to resign her job. And we were discussing all that. And we were talking about her kids being at home now. And I said, really, all you need to do right now is to read to your kids. Just read them, love them, give them things to keep their hands and mind occupied productively. Don't worry about the schoolwork and all that right now. And like I said, she's oftentimes just too tired to even do anything. So we had discussed that. And she said, you know, when I was working, it was partly because it was the easier thing to do. Having my kids at home was hard and being responsible for them all the time was hard. So really working was the easier thing to do. And I know that, you know, some of you might be working and that may not be the case with you, but for her it was. Parenting is hard work. Being a good, involved and intentional parent is hard work. Um, so, uh, I want to encourage you in that and, um, and just really try to help you understand what the Lord uh, is encouraging you to do with your children. It doesn't have to be homeschooling, but it's whatever you choose. Um, there's not one Bible verse that I know of that tells me to teach my children science, math, or grammar. Did you guys know that? That's not in the Bible anywhere. All right. And uh, some of you might take that and run with it. I don't have to teach my kids grammar. It's not in the Bible. But it is in the Bible. You know, God wants our children to know him. And if we're going to know him, we should know about his creation and know about the world that he created and know about the systems and the creativity and all the knowledge that he has given us and all the things we've discovered. Through knowing those things, our kids are going to learn about God. And I want them to know God intimately. And he's not only revealed himself in his word, but he's revealed himself and continues to do so through his creation. So as my kids learn math, science, or grammar, they learned of God through learning about his creation and how it operates. Um, as our children learn every subject, the character and person of God is revealed. His truths are borne out in every field of study. The real purpose for education is to know God and glorify him. All right. So number one, your parenting responsibility is to teach your children to love God. All right. That's in your notes. And the best education is going to be the one that integrates the heart, soul, and mind and strength of your child. So that's the best education is the one that integrates the heart, soul, mind, and strength of your child. You can put your children in all kinds of schools, but if they're not hitting all four of those things, they're not really getting the best education. Are there schools out there that do that? Yes, there are. Okay. Um, but they're hard to find. And um, so you guys have the opportunity to do this in your home. All right. So the next reason to, um, the next reason to homeschool is parent re parenting responsibility number two, and that comes from Matthew 28. And I'm not going to go into, I'm not going to read that for you because I'm going to um, cut some time here. But Matthew tw uh, 28, 19 says that basically you're to go and make, God gave this charge to his disciples and his charge was to go and make disciples. Your children are to be disciple makers. One of the reasons that um, you want to take that responsibility on as a parent is to train your children how to be disciple makers. You want to teach your children how to share Christ with the world. All right. I was going to go a lot in more into that because I could talk all day on that, but I'm not going to, but that's your responsibility is to disciple your children so that they can disciple others. Okay. So responsibility number two is to equip your children to be disciple makers. All right. Number three. Um, is to steep them in the truth. Reason number three, our responsibility number three is to steep them in the truth. It's when we educate with excellence that we can be confident that our kids have the, kids have the knowledge and confidence to go out into the world in a variety of occupations. In every occupation, it does not matter what job your child is in, they're going to be a disciple maker. They're there to share Christ. 
It doesn't mean they're going to stand up on the floor every day and just give the gospel message, but they are to live a life to attract people to God. And then, okay, they're going to make a defense for the gospel. So I'm not going to go through these scriptures either, but I want you guys to read through these scriptures and read through the admonition that Paul gives um, about living in the truth, knowing the truth and living in the truth. Um, God said, uh, Paul says that, um, that by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Your kids need to know him, know how to handle the truth. And then, um, you know, Paul says, it gives me great joy to know that my children are walking in the truth. I hope that's true for you guys one day, that you're going to have the joy of knowing that your kids walk in the truth. As a mom who's on the other side of that, and I see my daughters living adult lives now and how they live out the truth, I am amazed and humbled by their wisdom and their devotion that they have to God's word. I, they are so much wiser than I was at that age, so far, so far beyond what I was at that age. And a lot of it is because they were steeped, they've been steeped in the truth since day one of their lives. So no matter where you put them in school, you need to steep them in the truth. And they need to be able to handle the truth with boldness and confidence. So um, no matter what field they're in, they're going to be faced with truth detection and truth defense. They're going to have to defend the truth. And um, you guys have probably heard the story about how a bank teller supposedly is trained to recognize the counterfeit. It's by handling the real thing. They handle the real, you know, the feel of real money so that when the fake stuff comes through, um, they can tell that it's counterfeit. Okay. I'm going to tell you a little story. When my kids came home from camp or college or small group, uh, I would hear all kinds of stories and questions. They would ask all kinds of questions, but usually they were just telling me on and on and on about the stuff that they had talked about and learned uh, wherever they had been. And I'll just give you guys one parenting tip. And I got this parenting tip from someone. If you want to know, if you want it, your kids to talk to you, you need to stay up late because they talk late in the evening. When they come home, you need to be awake so they'll talk to you. Okay, and it's a great, great time to connect with your kids. Um, so there were times when our kids would come home from camp and they would be going, well, like they were uh, child care assistants up at uh, a camp and they would come home talking about what the devotions were and asking if the theology was right and going, they weren't really speaking the truth, mom. They weren't talking about the Bible. Um, then they would sometimes have questions for their dad. He's a pastor, so he knows a lot more than all of us. And, um, you know, they were asking, does it line up with the word of God? That was always their thinking. Does this line up with the word of God? And I can honestly say that my girls were doing a much better job thinking about that at that age than I ever did. And they were curious. They wanted to know, does this line up? So be forewarned, Homes and I know this is always a question you guys have, are my kids gonna be weird? Yes, they're gonna be weird. But they're not gonna be weird in a weird way, they're gonna be weird in a way because in scripture there is no teenage, there are no teenagers. There's no such thing as a teenager. There's a child, there's a young adult, and there's an adult. And if you're doing your job uh, the way that God asks you to by steeping them in the truth, by training them to love God, by um, discussing and working through all those things in your own home, they're going to go from childhood into young adulthood without a hitch. And um, you're going to make that transition, I think, a lot more smoothly because by the time they're in seventh and eighth grade, you really should be giving them adult responsibilities as adult Christians. In high school, you should be giving them more adult responsibilities. And so they're going to be different. They're going to be bored at youth group because they're going to, their thinking is going to be way beyond what those kids are discussing. They're not going to need to be discussing what somebody said on social media because they're going to know the dangers already and what that does. 
you know, they're going to be curious about God's word. They're going to be able to discuss difficult subjects. My kids knew about abortion, not in graphic detail, but they knew about that stuff when they were young. They watched life happen in a normal fashion at home. Okay, we did not shelter our children. We did not hide them under the covers. You know, we didn't do that. We protected them, but we didn't shield them from what life is. You know, this person chose this. These are the consequences. This is the life and the result of sin. We never hid that from them. Of course, we approach things with an age-appropriate discussion, okay, as Emily's laughing over here. But we discussed it in an age-appropriate, you know, way, but we didn't, we didn't really didn't hide things from them. So um, your kids are going to be weird that way, let me just tell you. I'm going to interject, Mom. I'm laughing because um, one of my friends on here is saying that she was homeschooled as well, and she's making me laugh because she said, of course I was weird. I couldn't hold a conversation with other teenagers because they were absolutely ridiculous. And so that was just to your point. I was like, yes, we were weird. I was considered weird too. A lot of adults who worked with teenagers didn't know how to deal with me because I didn't act and talk like other teenagers that they talked and talked with because I, yeah, so they will be weird. But my question is like, what weird is bad and which weird should we be aiming for? Right. Good. That's a good point, Emmy. Um, we were, okay. Another thing about this too, is we were so truth oriented in our life um, that Emily, I'm going to say it was Emily. We had, we decided in our home and if you have ch children in your, in your room, you might want to not listen and go past this. Cause I'm going to talk about, that man who wears the red suit at Christmas time. Um, we decided to be truthful with our children and tell them the truth and then to say, but we have a lot of fun pretending. Okay, we have a lot of fun pretending. So we didn't realize what that was gonna do until Emily went to her Sunday school class and told everyone that, yeah. Okay, so she told everyone, and it was funny because my husband got a phone call from the children's uh, director and said, hey, um, we had someone in, you know, Sunday school say this, and this is, she's five, say this, what do I do? And then he said, oh, and then she said it was Emily. So, <laughs> so we just laughed. There are some things you need to tell your children that, you know, this is how our family handles it, but other families don't handle it that way. And so, you know, conversations about uh, intimate things, same kind of thing. You want to be honest with them and you should start those conversations young. You're getting all kinds of free parenting advice here, but just understand that we, you should, and we should all hold truth to be very high value. And um, so that's how far I was when I was being intentional with my children. That's how far we went. So you make your own decisions for your own home. I'm not going to die on that hill. Um, but truth should be a very high, should be the ultimate value in your home. So your children are going to be the church's next gener generation of leaders. So they need to know the whole truth and need to rightly divide it. So um, do you guys, what I would like you to do, take a minute, you don't have to put it, you don't have to put it in the chat, but take one minute on scribble on a piece of paper, take one minute and write your purpose for homeschooling, okay? Or at least for looking into homeschooling, write your purpose. Like if you could be really heady and philosophical, what would be your purpose, okay? It doesn't have to be perfect, I just want you thinking. Although if you wanted to put it in chat, it would be really interesting to see. Yeah. I, you don't mind sharing it. That's okay. That's okay, Deb. You are so good at reminding me that that, you know, is there for a reason. Well, we are down to about 30 minutes. Okay, thanks. And I know there was a couple of questions about the vaccination thing. Oh, yeah. Did I not? Oh, I'm sorry. I totally skipped that. I'll yeah, come back to that. We probably have time for some just questions and things. Okay, while you guys are writing down your purpose, I'm gonna talk about vaccinations. If you are part of a public school that has a campus, you'll need to vaccinate your children most likely because that, that's what they are required to require from the state. If you, your child is a, in a charter 
that's a homeschool charter and you're not meeting on a campus or anything like that, which they don't let you do anyway, um, then you won't need to vaccinate. Um, now, could that change? Sure, it might change. I don't know why they would change it because you're not in a group of children. But um, right now, you don't have to um, you don't have to vaccinate your children if they're not on a campus with other students. Debbie, how did you handle that with your stuff? Well, so I was just going to say um, that's another one of those it depends things, and things change at the state level. It feels like every five minutes in the last year. So we hold camp uh, classes in Pinion Hills at the community center, and we don't require vaccinations. Um, but I, I don't know what's going to happen in the fall. There's some different things going through with requirements for vendors where they might have to require different things. Mm -hmm. So um, there's some legislation going through right now that we're watching. I don't know that it specifically has language about vaccinations. But there is more and more of a trend towards making the homeschool charters more like the actual brick and mortar public schools. Right. It's they're gonna something to watch. It's definitely something to watch. Yeah, they're really gonna try to uh, make vaccinations mandatory for everybody as much as they possibly can. But if you're homeschooling under the affidavit or um, now your PSP, they may ask you to be vaccinated, have certain vaccinations too, if they're providing on campus things or if you're gathering in a home, you know, that's up to the PSP, uh, you know, that's up to that program to decide what, you know, what their requirements are. Yeah, but, I feel the same thing for the vendors. It's probably the same thing. Some might require it but they should let you know on their website or up front. Like, I don't know of any that do, but that doesn't mean there aren't. Right. Uh, really, filing your own affidavit is going to be the most regulation-free way of homeschooling. So we'll just, you know, put it that way. You do need to ask those questions when you uh, sign up and things. And there are a few people that are closely watching Sacramento. Like, if you're on Facebook, and you message me, I can connect you up with a few of the groups that are very, very closely watching um, legislation that goes through Sacramento. There's a lady named Wendy Eklund. I, I think this is all she does, actually. She is, I don't even know how she has time to do anything else, but she keeps up with all of this stuff, and she posts it out to a whole bunch of different Facebook groups so we can all know about it. Yeah, I also gave you a link, I thought, in there. Is there a link in your notes for the vaccinations? Let me look. Yeah, there's a, there's a link that I gave you in the notes, so you can go on there, and that should kind of keep you up on uh, the vaccination. It's this weird flow chart, but I think you're all smart enough to, you know, figure it all out. So, okay, so let me keep going here. Um, family purpose, I, in your, uh, the email that I sent out to you, I gave you a family purpose statement and I gave you an intent, uh, my friend's intent to homeschool. Um, Debbie, do you want to read to me or Emily, why don't you do it? Read to me some of the reasons that some people put down for um, homes. Maybe it's just uh, Loren here. Um, yeah, Loren um, said she that and I sound philosophical, but basically, especially since putting Chandler in public school, preschool, um, he had a Christian teacher, but it was not thrilled things he was learning from other kids. And later on, you know, teachers and peers that aren't Christians are spending 30 hours a week with um, her kids. What are they teaching them in terms of values and morals? She just wants to raise our kids to love the Lord and obviously love and care about my kids more than the state of California. Just very true to learn. <laughs> um, so when you guys, Lauren's already thinking about her purpose for her homeschool. All of you guys are probably all, you've got all these reasons in your head, but I want you to develop a purpose statement for your family. And you should do this no matter what, what you're doing for school. You should come up with a purpose statement for your family. And, um, you know, George and I wanted to purposefully homeschool our children, so we had lots of you know, lots of discussions. What were we going to tell them about birth? What are we going to tell them about, about death? What's the value we're going to place on truth? You know, are we going to play make-believe about Santa and Easter Bunny? What are we going to do? What's the level of exposure to the real world that our kids are going to have? 
And we discussed these ideas, we went to conferences, we went to all kinds of different things. And over the years, we pretty much developed a, a purpose statement for our family and really what we wanted for our family. You know, and one of the best ways to start that conversation is what do we want our children to be like? What do we want our children to be like when they graduate and leave our home? You know, do we want to have to kick them out of our home or do we want them to be ready to leave our, you know, anxious to leave and get their life going and make a, you know, be responsible adults? What do we want them to be like when they're 30 and 40 and have grandkids? What do we want them to be like? That really should be the starting point of your discussion of your purpose statement. Um, so I want you guys to consider writing a purpose statement with your husband. Okay, so I think uh, we gauge what we did as our family, as a family, by our purpose statement. We didn't pull out our purpose statement and consider every activity and say, oh, is this going to meet our purpose statement? But as we talked and developed and read the scriptures, we determined and had discussed enough to where we knew if something was going to fall under that purpose or not. And it really helped us decide what activities are we doing, what things are we going to pour our time into, and things like that. Um, if you have older children, involve them in this after the, you, know, you and your husband have discussed it. If you're not married you know, and you're a single mom you know, educating your own kids, then have this discussion with somebody else who might be like-minded, you know, maybe a parent or something like that, who's coming alongside of you and helping and, um, you know, lay out all your dreams and your desires for your children. And this should be far more than just academic goals. In fact, academic goals should be like, they, the academic goals should come after you set the, the spiritual purpose for your family and the personal purpose for your family, um, because those academic goals should fall under all of that. So it should be the purpose for a God-fearing and God-serving family. So what's important to you as a family? I've, I've given you guys a list of questions to help you get started on writing your own purpose statement. What's important to you as a family? Is it generosity? Uh, are you guys want to be, you know, work like peacemaking? Maybe that's something um, you want to, you know, be involved in as a family. Is grace important to you as a family? You know, I'm sure as a Christian, yeah, grace is important, but families have personalities. Our family was a serving personality. That was a lot of our gifts was, was serving. So we served quite a bit. Um, some of your family talents might be music. Some of them might be sports. Some, you know, that might be your thing. That's where you're going to reach people for Christ is in sports programs. Uh, you need to decide that for your family. Um, every family purpose statement will be different. You might have a few of the same things, but it really should reflect the individuality of your family. It's the beauty of God's created diversity. Every family is created special and unique, meant to fill their purpose in the overarching plan of God saving a lost world. Remember, all of your purpose should focus on God using you uh, to save a lost world. So go ahead and you guys can look through those questions. I've given them to you. You can look at my purpose statement that George and I did. You can look at my girlfriend's statement that she did. They were very, she wrote it when they were thinking about homeschooling and she was going to have to make a defense to the school district. And so that's why it's written the way that um, hers is written. So See, there's a couple of more that got thrown into chat and um, you did a super good job about prioritizing spiritual growth. That's I'm mm -hmm. seeing that pretty much on everybody. Mm -hmm. Speak for a second to this lifelong love of learning part. Mm -hmm. um, so I've been I've been a college professor for 23 years. So I've had a lot of students come through my classroom, and I can tell you that their success isn't based on their academic ability or how they scored on the placement test. It's based on three things: how are they willing to do some hard work? Are they curious, and can they ask good questions? So I've had students that are probably C students, like however you want to rate that, right? Like average students, but they're hard workers because they've had to, because it doesn't come easy. They're curious about lots of things and they are willing to ask questions and they do way better than the students that all of it came easy to. Those guys are lazy almost all the time. And I think the biggest paradigm shift is a homeschooler, especially a homeschooler coming from public school is this idea that learning is something that 
doesn't just happen from eight to two in a room somewhere. Learning is something that you do all the time, everywhere, and anything counts. Like everything's learning. And once you kind of adopt that mind shift, homeschooling becomes a lot easier because it all counts. Like everything counts. And it, everything's integrated. Um, and people, you know, people make fun of that, of like, well, I'll tell you an example. Um, the other day I was pulling out mother journals because I wrote my kids letters and journals and things like that, giving them advice all the time, of course. They've all heard the advice, but I wrote it down. And um, I was uh, reading an entry that I made and Madison, my youngest and I were cleaning out file folders and Taylor was, grad it just happened to be the day before Taylor was graduating. And I was looking at all the file papers and I was writing in my journal that night that that file folder showed just a small, small portion of the education that Taylor had. And for three, sorry, I get, I get emotional about this because it's meaningful. For three pages, I went on and listed so as many things as I could remember that poured in to who Taylor is as a young, as a young woman at that time, you know, well, she's still a young woman, but at, you know, at that time. And it included so many wonderful, fun memories. And if I sat down with my daughters, they're going to go, oh, I forgot about that. And every one of those experiences poured into who my daughter is, who each of my daughters are. And you guys have to understand that is homeschooling. It's not just about the academic. It's not just about, sure, that's a lot of it. But it's not just about that. It's developing the whole person. Do they love God with their heart, soul, mind, and strength? You know, and Debbie talks about lifelong learning. And um, actually, I just was going to come to that, Debbie, on my uh, other reasons for homeschooling. And uh, I have, I know you just have a blank space there. And I, I was going to give you all the blanks to fill in. But I said, we're just going to go with what I have time for, which isn't much. But academics. Um, one of the reasons or some of the reasons to homeschool for academics is to develop and practice the philosophy, edu uh, philosophy of education of your choosing. Some of you might want to go with a, cl a classical philosophy. Some may want to do Charlotte Mason. The more you get into this, if you come to my seminar, I talk about all these different things. You might have an idea of what education is in your head. Um, learning becomes a lifestyle. And this goes back to what Debbie was saying. It is inexcusable for a homeschool parent to allow their child to leave home without a lifestyle of learning. And I have, I have all three of my, well, one of my son-in-laws was homeschooled and the other two, I am so thankful that they love to learn because I'm, I'm an information person and they're so wonderful to talk to. And that was instilled into their lives. But as a homeschool parent, that's your responsibility to instill a love of learning into them. That does that mean they have to, you know, read Shakespeare every day? No, but they should be willing to want to learn it and say, wow, what, what are the things that make Shakespeare interesting and unique? Um, intellectual curiosity should become a lifelong habit. Let's think about this. Why do you think that is? You ask them questions all the time to get their brains moving. You guys, I are, I are, read a quote one time and it said that education is not the filling of a bucket. All right. It's not, they don't just open the lid and pour the facts in. That's not education. So I have, I have that quote on my teaching philosophy, by the way, it's really good. Yeah. It's a great quote. So, um, and this, this right here, this was like my main thing about academics. Education becomes a relationship, not an imparting of facts. Okay, it's the development of relationships with a family, with mentors, with authors, with experts, with great leaders, and interesting person, you know, interesting people. I had another mother entry, I don't, I'm not going to read it to you, but I, I had it, and I was, I was telling Emily about it today. I wrote down as many things as I could, as many of the people that I could recall that fed into my daughter's lives, and it was multiple pages of people. And some of them are people that were bad leaders, and some of them are people that they knew personally, you know, in real life, and some of them were people they just read about, but they all poured into my daughter's lives, and they all had relationships. 
my girlfriend said that her son picked up a Thomas the Tank Engine book when he was in high school. And he picked up the tank, Thomas the Tank Engine book and he looked at it and he said, oh, an old friend. Because, you know, he had been friends with Thomas the Tank Engine when he was a small child. It was his friend, you know. So you can choose the why. You can choose the content. You can control the methods. You can meet the individual, individual needs of your children. You can control the scope and the sequence, the when and the what. Uh, there's relational reasons to homeschool. Deep relationships can be nurtured. Greater child training can happen. Discipline and other needs can be met. Character training can be Bible-centered and undertaken in a natural setting. Mentors can be discovered. When my kids turned, uh, I think when they went into seventh grade, um, each of them had a mentor. A couple of them I kind of chose their mentors or we discussed it. One of them just said, this is who I want as my mentor. And each of my girls had a relationship with another woman um, than, you know, somebody other than me. And of course it was somebody that was going to, you know, have the same morals and biblical foundation that we had. And I think, it, you know, that filled a need in that time for them to have somebody else pouring into their life and telling them many of the same things that I would. So that's a good reason to be able to, to homeschool is you have time for that. Um, greater flexibility, time, we can talk about time. There's more flexib flexibility in scheduling. Time is not wasted. You guys all have those school experiences where you sat in class bored to tears, watching movies you had already seen. There's no need to waste time when you're homeschooling. You know, it doesn't mean you're going to be sitting at the table eight hours pouring over books. But they can if they want, you know. Or it might only take three hours to get your schoolwork done for the day. Um, it, it varies. Time's not wasted. There's greater opportunities for serving. I have told many people that we were often way too busy. My kids actually told me, Mom, we can't do any more. We don't have time to get our schoolwork done. And so, because I was always wanting them to, oh, go do this, go do that. Plus, they had things that they wanted to do. So um, there's time for ministry, family, adventures can be had, and you can try new things as a family. Um, pragmatics. You can relegate the cell phones and the technology to its proper place as a tool. You can save yourself and the state a lot of money. In California, it ta uh, the state spends $11,500 per student every year to school them. Okay, uh, 6,800 of that actually goes to classroom instruction. Um, parents spend an average of anywhere from $700 to $1,017 to get their kids ready for elementary school. Okay, so this free education, that's what you're spending to put your kids in school, um, just for public school. And in high school, it's 12,000 up to 16, or 1,200 up to 1,600. And that doesn't include sports, uniforms, and all the other activities. That's just on what you spend to get your kids into school. So, um, okay, one other thing, Deb, and then we'll do a couple of questions. Um, the last important part of why homeschool is you. All right, um, you're important. You're the important part of all of this right now. And I want you to know that you can learn. And this is the part that Emily, I know it gets excited about. Taylor, she, I can't see her, but I know she gets excited about this too, is that you can learn as much or more than your kids. All right, you're gonna know so much when you're done homeschooling. Your brain's gonna explode on some days. Um, you're gonna be stretched and challenged. It'll be hard. It'll make you cry, sometimes a lot. Um, but you're going to be blessed tremendously. It's going to stretch you. You're going to learn how to depend on God. Um, I had one mom who I barely knew. She was a homeschool mom. Her, her husband was a, teach, a school teacher. She said, after I told her all my fears and worries about homeschooling, uh, she said, if God is calling you to this, he will change you and equip you to do it. And years later, I know no truer words were told me and given to me as advice. God will equip you and help you to do what he calls you to do. So, all right, some questions. I know that um, I have some places in the back for you to uh, write some common concerns if you have common concerns. So as we're kind of talking for the last few minutes, um, there's places for you guys to um, write some answers down. So do you guys have any 
questions that didn't, I'm sure you have a lot of questions that didn't get answered, but anything along the lines of what we're talking about tonight? And I'm gonna throw into chat, we have a parent group um, on Facebook, so I'm just gonna throw that link in there and my email address, um, especially if you have questions about college stuff. I can connect you, there's a Facebook group for everything homeschool related, and I'm on most of them, so I can connect in if you wanna be connected in. And there are some outspoken homeschoolers out there, so be careful. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, the weird ones, right? <laughs> Go weird homeschoolers. Well I, want, well, I want you guys to know, if the parents are weird, the kids are going to be weird. So if you're a weird parent, you're going to have weird kids. All right? If you're not a weird parent, your kids might still turn out a little different, but they won't be that weird. Okay? Uh, I have to admit, I, I gave in a little bit to temptation because... Some of you guys mentioned socialization right there up at the front, and that's kind of the flag that everybody waves about, waves about homeschoolers and unsocialized homeschoolers. And so um, somebody posted something about all the public schoolers being stuck at home, and so I hashtagged it unsocialized public schoolers, you know, because they're having the same problem with that, right? But just get involved with stuff. There's plenty to get involved with. Yeah, I'd say actually I think something that I think – I would say that surprised people is that my favorite part of homeschooling was the socialization um, because my socialization was like, like, yeah, I definitely, I'm an extreme extrovert. And so I always up for more people time. I don't think I ever have enough. So I wanted to always do more when I was in high school, especially, but um, I would say that the time that I did get with people was better. I wasn't getting shushed in class for talking or having to just chat in between things. Like I, when I did get my people time, like it was, we were working on projects together or it was just like, we got to hang out and do our thing. Or in high school, my friend, my best friends and I put on a musical with all the other homeschool kids and, and we like led the whole musical. Like we got to do like really fun things together that, and then I would say this, as I'm going into to, um, homeschooling and as watching my mom do it, um, you are, your homeschooling will only be enriched and it will only be easier if you find a community around you to do it with you. Because those were the best days where I have some of my best friends still that we homeschooled together and we did co-ops almost weekly sometimes and we did book groups and we did nature. Like there's, and there's so much out there right now, especially nowadays online, you can find nature groups and you can find so many cool like-minded groups of people out there that if you're feeling overwhelmed like find some people that are like-minded in your area and do it with them because um they'll that other mom will care more about science than you care about so when you get there they can help you out with that or that other mom will be more interested in this that your kids gonna like and, and you just kind of feed off each other and encourage one another and your kids get plenty of socialization with kids of different ages because when in life you hang out with only people the same age as you, you know, so your kids will get um, plenty of time. I'm sure um, Laura's husband could tell you, you know, all of the, uh, the great socialization that you can do as a homeschooler um, and still be weird, but. Well, and yeah. Emily, you just brought up like a super good point because a lot of parents don't jump into homeschooling because they think they have to be the ones to teach it all. Yes. You get in with a co-op, you find some other parent, you take a class, you learn it while the kid's learning it. And there's well, and then the other thing too, I, and I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give a, this is another shameless plug. In my full, my full workshop that I do, I do talk about socialization, homeschooling, I mean, uh, co-ops, how to do a co-op, yeah. how to become the person that you want to do things with. Um, and we do talk about that. What is a co-op? How do we get classes? How do we do all those kinds of things? You know, you don't always have to pay for everything. You just find somebody and you go, hey, you know, do you want to do a cooperative on the human body? And we all got together and we all planned it. And we said there's, I don't know how many systems there are, five systems in the body. We handed out, assigned it and everybody did their own thing. And we all went to somebody's house and switched around and we all worked together. And then at lunch, which was our favorite part. We sat around, the kids went outside and played and we got to sit and visit as moms. And to be honest with you, that was the most edifying and encouraging time in my homeschooling was to spend time with, and I am still close friends with those moms. They're, we're all scattered, our kids are all scattered, but we all still are very close friends. And I wouldn't even know Debbie if it hadn't been for homeschooling. Yeah, true. 
yeah, her kids are, you know. Well, my daughter Emily and your daughter Madison are about the same age. My Emily's like you, Emily. She's so extroverted. Yeah. <laughs> That's how she gets her energy. Yeah. I've never met an Emily that isn't. Does anyone else have any? I should have known that before I named her. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> should. Um, I want to thank you, Emily, um, for sharing that about us. Um, I wanted to speak on behalf of my mom. Um, I was homeschooled from second grade all the way through. Yay! She always said, hi. <laughs> she always said, um, kind of like what you both were saying earlier, um, what motivated her to decide that, make that final choice of, uh, you know, my kids may not be socialized, but let me see what other homeschool kids do. She realized that the homeschool kids did a great job conversing with adults. And she really liked that. Um, she noticed like, you know, her, her, my older half brothers, her stepson, and he was in public school where he grew up. And she said he was really good at conversing with the kids in his exact age group always. But that was kind of where his limit was, you know? And then, I mean, as an adult, that obviously changed. But she, she saw these other homeschool families and said, those kids can talk with adults and function excellently. And just like Emily was sharing right now too, um, in homeschool groups, when you're spending that much time with other homeschool families, I wasn't just hanging out if I was in fifth grade, I wasn't just hanging out with the other fifth grade kids. I was hanging out with the kids that were much younger and much older, um, learning from the older ones and helping teach the younger ones. And so you kind of get like that. It reinforces the same thing you're describing as a homeschool mom. Uh, you're learning as you teach. Your kids get to do that too because the kids are teaching younger kids. Mm -hmm. They're learning from the older kids. Yeah, and it's a true relational community. Like Emily was saying, it's not a false, it's not a false grouping of people. You know, it, you are introduced to life in the natural scope of things. I mean, just in the natural ebb and flow of life. And I remember when Emily was just little bitty, and um, we, one of my homeschool mentors, uh, she was a wonderful, her, her daughter is, a, is now in the secret service or was, you know. Okay, so homeschool people can be in the secret service, ladies. So um, she, I remember her, I watched her holding Emily's hand and um, her older daughters kind of took my younger daughters by the hand. And they probably don't even remember this, but on field trips and things like that, they'd always have their little hand, you know, and walk them around. And then the other thing is, you know, you guys talk about relationships that, you know, when you're homeschooling and I, this came to mind with field trips and stuff, you know how, when you go on field trips as a whole classroom and the shortest person's always in the back, I was always the shortest person and all those homes, those, those school kids would always be up against the glass. And then the docent would be moving them all along and the kids want to stand there and they want to watch what's going on for like 20 minutes. Well, the docents moving them along, moving them along. They don't have a, a chance to even create any kind of relationship with anything around them because there's no time. Homeschool allows for the time to develop those race relationships. And one of the things, one of the reasons why, one of the things that people mostly said about our kids is that they could have a conversation with adults and they were interested in what the adults were saying. And they have had some fine relationships with adults in their lives, you know, growing up fine people so cassie i always when, whenever we do these zoom things i always like to respect people's time okay and it's, and it's nine See, that's why we have debbie here but, but i'm going to put in a shameless plug for you because so the main goal tonight you hopefully you got some like good info like solid information about how to file and you know different options there's so much more and cassie's got an amazing workshop um and she didn't want this to feel like a like a promo for the workshop because hopefully you walked away with something good here but if there's more you want to know i'm sure she'll send out an email or something like we're kind of looking at what dates would work and stuff for a longer workshop because there really is just so much you can't cram it all into two hours mm -hmm. and i think when we were talking earlier you said you were going to limit the workshop to about eight people so yeah. they really work with people. Yeah, we'll try to accommodate. If there's more people that want a workshop like that, um, and I get more than eight people that would be interested in that, I would do a whole nother group. Right. But I think I would want to keep it down so we could have time to discuss and we could, you know, talk more personally in that workshop. And it would cover a lot of the things that, um, you know, all the nitty gritty kind of things, setting up a just all the different things like 
what, it, what is Charlotte Mason education? What does it mean to be a classical homeschooler? Um, you know, how do I involve dad? What is, you know, what are the problems with homeschooling? There are problems with homeschooling and we address, we address that as well. Um, you know, how to do literature, all that kind of stuff. So. And I think it's safe to say like the goal was mostly that you walk away from here confident that this is something you can do. You know, that there, it is a thing you can do and that there are bigger pictures to look at than the academics. Like I know Cassie, you said the academics are important. You know, all these other things are good and the academics are important. I would venture to say the academics are okay, but they'll pick up, they'll get that stuff. They'll figure out their multiplication tables. They'll, they'll get all that stuff if you focus on the right thing. Mm -hmm. Right. If you focus on memorizing multiplication tables, they might miss out on all the stuff that's really important. Um, and I'm telling you this as a college professor with homeschoolers that come into my class, with public schoolers that come into my class, the ones that can ask the questions who are curious, um, it doesn't matter what their pre-existing knowledge is. They figure it out. So thank you, Cassie. It, it, I just love talking to her and listening to her. She like just knows so much and does it so well. Thank you. Same to you, Debbie. Thank you. And Emily, thank you for yeah. chiming in there. I appreciate it. Yeah, it's good to hear from a homeschool survivor, right? So Yeah, a couple, a few of them. <laughs> yeah, a couple of them. That's really good. And yeah. Taylor, Taylor might have been in there too if Taylor had had her makeup on. But <laughs> oh mom, you throw it under the bus of the bus. Mom, that was has a pretty picture up. <laughs> if you're on um Instagram, um I follow a, a Instagram account called um, learning well <clears throat> and it's a mom who every Wednesday she has a new homeschool mom take over her account and do a life in the day and I know she's not doing them through the summer but you could go back and look at all their posts that they've done at learning well and that's been yeah I'll put it in the chat it's been really helpful for me just to see like a day-to-day -day moms walking through their days and I love it and if you have more you can look for me on Emily Tabari at Instagram and I will send you all the homeschool accounts you could ever ask for if that's somewhere where I use it like a Pinterest board almost where I watch these people do their things and I like pin I like save ideas so if you need that I need to put in is this where I need to put in my warning of too much time on social media <laughs> that's a whole other workshop yeah. we can do a whole workshop on social media for parents and kids oh my gosh yeah so be careful you'll get overwhelmed and that's one reason why we do our workshop is because so many people are going to throw things at you, so much at you. And uh, in, in this workshop, we work through actually what to pay attention to. You know, you're going to decide what you want your homeschool to be like, and then you're going to be able to cut out a lot of the noise. Okay, because you're headed, you're headed to a certain point, and then that way it helps you cut out all the noise. Yeah, that's critical. Yeah. So remember, if you want to save the chat because there was a lot of really good stuff, you should be able down by where you type, click on the little box with three dots and save the chat from there. And we did record this. Hopefully it'll be recorded and I'll, I'll try to figure out, Debbie can tell me how to send the link out for that if you want to listen to it again. That's funny. And, um, I don't know. Can you send it to friends? I don't even know. Yeah, what I'll do is just upload it to Google Drive and put it share it to anyone with a link. Okay. Hey mom, yeah. there's a good question from Sarah and Tony about is it possible in this anti-Christian society um, that homeschooling will be banned? Yes. Yes. Um, there was a, and I'll just answer this and then we'll close down. There was a newspaper and I was in the media and all that from a Harvard professor who a law professor who had a legal opinion and it was a very uninformed old opinion about homeschooling. I, on homeschool legal defense, they have a rebuttal to the letter. It's a seven part rebuttal. I highly recommend it. Um, so, and that's part of the reason why, like you're saying, mom, it's part of the reason why you should be following things like HSLDA because they can let you know what's going on in your state, what kind of laws and things like that are coming up so that you're really well informed. Um, there was a law that came up just last year. And when I talked to friends about what that, that, um, that thing was, they didn't understand. And they thought it sounded really basically, it sounded like it was protecting kids. And I had to explain to them how it would um, really uh, negatively affect homeschoolers. And they had no way to connect that, that it would badly affect homeschoolers. And so 
It's really important for you that if you care about it to keep up with things like HSLBA so that you can be um, really careful with voting and um, yeah. Yeah, I um, had, it makes a really good homeschool field trip to go to Sacramento <laughs> when they have, because some of these things have gone through committee and it, especially in the last year or two, huge groups of homeschoolers have gone up. There was one, I can't remember specifically which one, but there was one where the homeschoolers were literally lining the hall of the Capitol building, ready to go, going in and doing testimony after testimony after testimony for hours and hours. And the bill died in committee. They couldn't get a quorum to take it to vote. Yeah. So you need to, if you're going to homeschool, you need to be aware and you need to be active to maintain that right. Um, I don't think that they'll ban homeschooling. I think what they'll end up doing is try to, um, you know, like that professor, she thinks it should just be all regulated. Right. And that you should seek permission. But your children are your children. And the state of California recognizes, and the Supreme Court recognizes your right to direct the upbringing of your children. So you guys, um, you know, keep your eye and ears out on that stuff. The family, I think it's family protection ministries are quoted in the HSLDA articles as, uh, in, in those rebuttal articles. Go to HSLDA, spend a lot of time on there looking around and reading. Uh, you won't be able to get into all the places because if you're not a member, you won't. But there's plenty on there for people who are not members. Well, and, and the homeschooling movement has broadened way out beyond the home, Christian homeschoolers in denim skirts. I tried to get my girls, I was telling Cassie this, I tried to get my girls to wear denim skirts and the boys to wear the button-up shirt just for a picture, and they wouldn't do it. But... Um, there's a lot of people jumping on the homeschool bandwagon because they don't like what they're seeing in public schools. Well, and the problem with that, though, I just saw a quote the other day. We need to be careful because I don't want people, as a homeschooler, and I was a dyed-in-the-wool homeschooler. I filed my own affidavit. I did everything myself. And people who kind of jump on the bandwagon just because they don't like a school thing they can make a really bad name for homeschoolers. Yeah. So, um, you know, you'll be, if you like really um, grab onto homeschooling, people who just kind of ride on the coattails, you're going to go, mm -mm, you're not really a homeschooler. <laughs> be aware of that, you know. I mean, but yeah, We're, we're kind of running way over here. We could talk about this like all night, right? But this is my we could talk homeschooling all night. This is my fourth hour in Zoom. I've been on Zoom since five o'clock. Um, so I'm turning into a pumpkin. And, uh, but thank you guys for being curious. That's a big deal. It's a big deal. And if you're curious and you can help your kids be curious, that's all you need, really. Like, that's my opinion. Yeah. So, um, you know where to ask questions. Cassie will send out an email. Yeah, let me pray for you guys, okay? Lord, I thank you for this time together. I thank you for these parents who love their children and really have a desire to uh, see them grow and uh, in wisdom and stature and knowledge. And Lord, I know that they have a heart that they know you first and foremost. So I pray for our kids. I pray that they would follow you, that they would devote their lives to you. And that we would, as parents, would be faithful to the call that you've given us. Lord, I thank you. I pray that you would protect us all. And uh, we just love you so much. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. Right. Thanks for joining us, you guys. I really appreciate it. It was fun.